بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Okay, in the last lesson that we had, we uh, went through the chapter on uh, the chapter concerning Arriya or showing off, and I mentioned that this is one of two chapters in which Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, where he begins. So after previously discussing all of the actions of Shirk which which are outward, from this point he mentions the actions of Shirk which are inward, which can't be seen. So there were two chapters, one which is what has come concerning Arriya and the one after it which is that from shirk is that a person intends by way of his actions that he does for the deen, he actually intends the dunya and that we'll cover inshallah in uh, the next lesson that we have. But just to recap what we went through in the last chapter, <coughs> in, the, in the last lesson, then the points that came across uh, or the points that Sheikh Saleh al Fuzan elaborated upon in, in, the, in his explanation was uh, that first of all he said that shirk is of two types the shirk which is dahir and the shirk which is khafi the shirk which, which is outward and open that we can visibly see and the shirk which is inward and hidden so from the shirk that, that's outward it's clearly things like people uh, making an oath to other than Allah sacrificing to other than Allah seeking rescue by way of through other than Allah and all of these things which you can actually hear and you, you can see outwardly and the shirk which is khafi or which is it, hidden and inward is something that you cannot actually see and you can't you know it's something that's only in the heart you can't perceive it it's only in the hearts and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows uh, regarding that so <clears throat> the shaykh also explained that the shirk which was outward is you know the worship of the idols and the tombs and the mausoleums and the trees and the stones and so on and so forth. And as for the riya, uh, which is the subject of this uh, chapter, that it's something which relates to people's intentions and motives, and no one knows that except for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And then she clarified the difference between a riya and a sumaa, a riya and a sumaa. A riya is when actions are done with the intent behind them is that the people look towards that person and they you know they 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 look towards him and so that he is the you know object of the, of of their attention because he wants the people to look at him and and and, and see him and as sum'a as sum'a is that a person does actions or he makes statements uh or it's sorry it's it's in in regard to statements which outwardly they appear to be for the sake of Allah but inwardly the intent is other than Allah, right? So he wants his speech to be heard, whether it's uh, reciting the Quran or making dhikr or admonishing the people or whatever it is, giving a khutbah or whatever, then the intent behind it here is that he wants his speech to be heard, right? So this is uh, a sum'ah. So a riya is to be seen and a sum'ah is wanting to be heard. That's the difference between the two. And then the Shaykh explained how a riya is of two types the shirk which is akbar the shirk uh, the shirk which is the major shirk and this is when a person in all of his actions that he does then his intent behind them is to be seen by the people right in all in all of his actions and in reality this is just like the the riya of the hypocrites right because the hypocrites in everything that they do they intend to protect themselves from the muslimin and to be seen and to be, you know, to be, to be, to be you know, the, the seek other than Allah, and that's in all of their actions. And this can never ever occur from a believer. That's the first type. The second type is something which can occur from a believer, and that's the riyah which occurs in some of his actions as opposed to others, and these are actions in which he has an intent for Allah and an intent for something other than Allah. Now, with respect to the believer in this second type of a riyah, we said, the Sheikh explained that there were three scenarios that can exist. The first scenario is, is that when a person does a specific action, and from the beginning to the end, that before he does the action, 
right through all of the action right until the end, his intent is something other than Allah. And in this case, that action is rejected completely and outright. Like for example, when he intends to pray, but he intends to pray it so that the people can see him. And so he has that intent from the beginning, right through the action, right until the very end. That action is completely rejected. That's the first situation. Second situation was when his action, initially it begins with an intent purely for Allah. And then at some point it becomes mixed with an intent for other than Allah. And then, you know, it, it, you know he, he finishes on that he finishes on that, uh, you know, he finishes on that note. He finishes like that. Sorry, no, he, he, he begins for the sake of Allah and then some point through the action, his intention becomes impure. But then he repels it, he fights against it, he purifies his intention and then he returns back to ikhlas and then the action ends upon ikhlas. And regarding this, the shaykh says that this action won't actually, won't, won't harm him. Why? Because he repelled and he fought against it and even the action was initially for the sake of Allah and then he repelled whatever was impure from his intentions and he, and he brought it back to uh, sincerity. So, so this won't harm his action at all. And the third situation, the third scenario was when a person does an action, begins for the sake of Allah and then at some point the insincere intention comes along and then it finishes upon that. And it continues with him up until it finishes with the action. The Shaykh says that this is an issue of difference between the people of knowledge and some of them said that his action is rejected completely just like in the first scenario because it ended you know, upon you know, insincerity and some of them said that he will be rewarded for the degree and extent to which his action was initially uh, upon ikhlas and then for the rest of it he won't be rewarded for that and the Shaykh says that this view was explained by Al-Hafid ibn Rajab Alhamdulillah in his explanation of an Nabawi's 40 hadith. And then the Shaykh went on to explain the, 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 the ayah in the Quran, the last ayah in Surah, Surah Al-Kahf, which Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdullah brought in this, uh, in this chapter. Severally, I am a man just like you. It is revealed to me that your ilah is a single ilah. And then it continues to the end of the, the verse, that whoever hopes in the meeting with his Lord, then let him... Uh, work righteous deeds, work righteous deeds, and not associate anyone as partner in his, uh, with his Lord in, in 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 the worship of his Lord. Then the Sheikh explained just some benefits from uh, this verse, such as you know how the messenger sent are uh, sent as men so that the people can relate to them and understand them and learn from them, and also how this verse is a refutation of the people who make ghulu and extremism in the status of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and. Uh, then also the fact that uh, just a mention of Tawheed uh, and how the, the, our ilah is a single ilah and whatever is called upon besides Allah then that is batil and then uh, the shaykh can explain that what, what it means that whoever hopes in the meeting with his Lord this means whoever hopes to see his Lord it refers to the ru'ya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then uh, in the ayah at the end it says فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا salaha That let him work righteous deeds And the shaykh explained the two conditions of righteous deed Which are ikhlas and correctness And then he mentioned some proofs for that And uh, this basically was the essence of what was covered in the uh, previous lesson So now what remains in this chapter is that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Rahab He brings two ahadith As again in addition, in addition to the verse that he brought In order to illustrate or to explain uh, the, the topic of ar -riyah. So for the first hadith that he brings is from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who said uh, narrating from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam who said qala uh, ta'ala that Allah the most high said I am the most free of all partners of having of, 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 of I, I, I'm the free sorry I'm the most free of partners of being associate, associated uh, of having partners associated with me in shirk I'm the most free of that And so whoever does an action In which he associates someone else alongside me Then I will abandon him and his shirk This is reported by a Muslim And this hadith and Sheikh uh, Salih al-Fawzan explains uh, This hadith here in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, قَالُوا اللَّهُ تَعَالَى that Allah the Most High said, this indicates that this is a Hadith Qudsi. And the Hadith Qudsi is whatever the Prophet <coughs> Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he narrates from his Lord, and 
whatever he narrates directly from his Lord. And Al-Qudsi, what does it mean by Al-Qudsi? It means it's an ascription to Al-Quds. And Al-Quds means, it means purification, at tathir being pure, and at tanzih and you know, being free of any kind of blemishes or impurities or, you know, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of imperfections or things of that nature. This is the meaning of Al-Quds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is muqaddas and munazzah. He is free and pure of any type of attributes that are deficient, that, that denote deficiency. And Al-Hadith Qudsi is whatever is from the speech of Allah, both in wording and its meaning. This is the definition of a Hadith Qudsi. What is from the speech of Allah, both in its wording and its meaning, and which the Messenger والسلام, has narrated from Allah, has reported from Allah. And so the difference between the Hadith Qudsi and the Hadith An-Nabawi, the difference between it is that the Hadith Qudsi, as we said, is that in both its meaning and its wording, it is reported from Allah. And as for the Hadith An-Nabawi, the prophetic Hadith, then that is who, that whose meaning is from Allah, but its wording is from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah reveals the meaning to the Messenger and the Messenger he uses his own words to convey that meaning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ That he does not speak of his own desire, it is no less than revelation that is inspired to him. So therefore, when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said in this hadith, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ When the Messenger said that, this proves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in whatever manner he wishes and in, in, in whatever manner befits his majesty. So Allah, Allah affirms that Allah speaks. Then the Messenger said that from the saying of Allah is Ana Agna Shuraka Ana Agna Shuraka Ali Shirk. The meaning rough mean, meaning which is that I am the most free of partners of having any one else associated with me in, in, in shirk uh, as, as a partner. So the shirk says this means that Allah is free. He's not in need of the worship of his creation. He doesn't need any of that. But he's only commanded them with worship for their benefit. Right? So Allah himself is in need of the worship that he's ordered us with. Rather that order upon us to worship him is for our own benefit. For the, for the reason that Allah may forgive them and that he may give them sustenance, and that he may enter them into paradise. So really, the maslaha, the actual benefit in the ibadah, returns back to the servants. And as for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the obedience of any person who obeys him doesn't benefit him at all. And nor does the disobedience of any person who disobeys, does it harm him at all. But rather, Allah himself, who is the originator of benefit and the originator of harm. So, and, and, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in an ayah in the Qur'an uh, إِن تَكْفُرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنْكُمْ وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفْرِ وَإِن تَشْكُرُوا يَرْضَهُ لَكُمْ That verily, if you disbelieve, Allah is free of any need from you. And Allah does not like disbelief from His servants. He's not pleased from His servants that, that they show disbelief or ingratitude. And if you show gratitude, then he is pleased with it for you. He is pleased with it for you. And he also said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, and this is quoting the speech of Musa al-Islam, Allah says, وَقَالَ Musa, and Musa said, إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ and Musa said that if you disbelieve you and whoever is upon the earth, all of, who, 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 all of who, whoever is upon the earth, then really Allah is free of all need and praiseworthy. And in another hadith, Qudsi, which is reported by Abu Dhar, radiallahu anhu, he says that Allah, that the Messenger, Ali Sallallahu that Allah SWT said, Ya ibadi, or my servants, if the first amongst you and the last amongst you the men amongst you and the jinn amongst you were to be upon 
the heart of the most pious man amongst you, then this wouldn't increase anything in Allah's dominion. It wouldn't increase anything in, Allah, in what Allah uh, owns. And if the first of you and the last of you and the jinn amongst you and the, 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 the men amongst you were upon the most sinful and evil heart from uh, the, the men, all the men amongst you, then it wouldn't decrease anything from my, from my dominion. So therefore, all of this shows that the worship of the people for Allah, the reward for it, and everything else that follows on from it, it really benefits, it comes back upon the servants and not to Allah. As for Allah, then he is free of any need from that. And this shows therefore, so in light of this explanation that the Shaykh has just explained, this therefore shows that whoever does an action in which he associates other than uh, he associates with Allah other than him Then Allah is not in need of it In other words What the shaykh is saying that Even the ibadah that a servant gives to Allah Which is sincere and pure Allah is not in need of that Allah is not in need of that anyway to begin with Because it doesn't benefit him in anything Allah, Allah hasn't ordered us with that for his benefit Rather it's for our own benefit And if that's the case with an action That's just, that's just normal worship Purely and sincere for Allah then what about the one in which someone associates other than Allah with him in that worship? Then Allah is even more, he is, he is, he's even more, uh, sorry, he's even more not in need. Right? Meaning, meaning that, you know, it's, it's even more worthy that he is not in need of that and not in need of accepting that. But rather Allah only accepts that which is sincere from his servants which, and which is only for their own benefit. So, this shows then that, and, and of course, a riyah would enter into this. A riyah would enter into this. Whoever does an action and in which a riyah enters into it and he intends other than Allah, then Allah will reject it and Allah will not accept it. And it's from this angle, the Shaykh explains that this is the angle of evidence that we are extracting from this hadith. And when Allah says, Taraktuhu wa shirkuhu wa shirkahu, that I will abandon him and his shirk, this shows, this actually is a proof that shirk actually does nullify actions, irrespective of whether that shirk is major shirk or whether it's minor shirk. That shirk will still nullify a person's action. And the shirk then finishes by saying that what, what, what is what the point of evidence in this chapter uh, from this hadith is, is that a riya is a type of shirk which causes actions to be rejected and Allah will not accept it. So that was the first hadith. The second hadith that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab brings is the hadith which is narrated by Abu Sa'id bin al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu who said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said Shall I not inform you of that which is more feared by me for you than al-Masih al-Dajjal? So they said, of course, tell us. And he said, al-Shirk al-Khafi. Al-Shirk al-Khafi, the hidden shirk. A man, he stands and so he beautifies his prayer so that, uh, that, so that whoever is around him may look, at, will, may look towards him. This hadith is reported by Ahmed. So the Shaykh explains this hadith, he comments and he says that Abu Sa'id, here is Abu Sa'id in Al-Khudri, and his name is Malik bin Sinan, al- bin Sinan Al-Khudri, and he is the noble and famous, uh, well-known Sahabi. May Allah be pleased with him. And... This hadith, concerning this hadith, the messenger said, Shall I not inform you of that which is which is more feared by me, for you, which I fear more for you, than al-Masih al-Dajjal. The Shaykh explains that this hadith, the, 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 the reason behind this hadith, or this, the, the context of this hadith was that the Prophet ﷺ were, went out to his to the Sahaba and they were talking about the Masih al-Dajjal. They were sitting and speaking about Masih al-Dajjal. And they were speaking about his tribulation, about his fitna. And they were fearful of him. You know, they, they were expressing and they, they had this fear of him. So the Messenger والسلام, said, Shall I not inform you of that which is more feared, which I fear more for you than the Masih al-Dajjal? To the end of the hadith. And this is the context in which this statement is made. So the Sahaba said, Bala, of course, meaning informers. And this, the Shaykh says, indicates 
the legis that the, it's legislated and it's permissible in the Sharia of teaching by way of asking a question. Right? Because here the messenger asked the question first, and uh, the Sahab responded, "Yes, of course." You know, informers and the Sheikh says that this type of method is something that is sticks more in a person's mind, and. Uh, the Sheikh says, so if a person wants to teach, you know, his his companions, you know, then he can do it by way of uh, a question, so that they, you know, that they, uh, so that they kind of anticipate the the answer, and then this answer can then be presented to them, and this is something that is more likely to stick in in in, in their minds. So that's one benefit from this hadith, that that one, from the forms of teaching is to ask a question first, and let the people anticipate the answer. The secondly. Uh, then the messenger obviously replied, "Ashirk al khafi the shirk which is hidden. And a man, then the messenger explained, a man stands, he prays, and so he beautifies his prayer so that those who are around him may look towards him. The shirk explains that ar is from the hidden shirk. And the angle from which it is hidden is because, as has been explained before, it's in the person's intentions and his motives. And it relates to the actions of the heart, which of course no one can see. No one knows except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knows the intentions, no one knows the maqasid, the, the people's motives, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this hadith is an indication of the great danger of this arriya. Because why? The Messenger Ali Sallam he feared for his ummah, he feared for he feared he feared it for his ummah more than Al Masih al Dajjal. And of course the second issue is who is he speaking to? He is speaking to the Sahaba. Radiallahu anhu when he said this. So how much more then for those who are besides the Sahaba? You know this you know having fear of Riyah. The messenger feared for Riyah, he is speaking in the context of the Sahaba then. How much more for those besides them? So uh, this shows that the fear upon those besides them will be more more severe. And it's more severe than the fear for Al Masih al Dajjal. Because there will be very few people who will be safe from Al Masih al Dajjal, and and very few people who will be who will be who will be safe from Arya. As for Al Masih al Dajjal, then uh, the the Sheikh says that despite his fitna being great, then the 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 the, the, the harm of Al Masih al Dajjal will be only those people who will be living in his time. And as for ar ar is a danger upon everyone in all times. This is another angle to, to this hadith. That Al-Masih al-Dajjal, his time is only for the people in his time who are contemporary to him. But as for ar it is for everyone no matter in which time that they, that they, that they live. And Al-Masih al-Dajjal, al al then he is the Masih of misguidance who will appear at the end of time. And his appearance will be from the signs of the hour. And the reason why he's been called Al Masih, there are two uh, reasons. First reason is that he's Mamsuhul Ain, meaning that he is one eyed and that there's like a that, that there's damage or something wrong with one of his eyes. That's one reason he's been called Al Masih. And the second reason is because he's been called Al Masih is due to the speed at which he will travel upon the earth. You know, meaning that Yamsahul Ard Bisura, meaning that he will traverse the earth with speed and this is a, another uh, reason why he's why he's been called al masih in any case he is the masih of ad dalala he is the masih of misguidance and he is the one eyed liar and there is no has been no prophet except that he warned his ummah from the dajjal and the warning of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the most severe and the most often you know, than, than, than the prophets who came before him. Why? Because the prophet was the closest to the time of Ad Dajjal or to the appearance of the Dajjal. And so he will come at the end of time. The the people who will follow him are the Yahud and then Al Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, the, uh, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, who is the Masih of, of guidance. He will come and he will kill the Dajjal at the gate of Al Lud. Al Lud is a place in Palestine. And at this time, the Muslims will be freed from his evil and then the Muslims will be aided against the Yahud and the Islam, the Islam will emerge and it will appear as a rule upon the earth and the truth will, will emerge. All of this will be after 
trials and you know tribulations. And the Prophet وسلم, he legislated for us that we seek refuge in all of this, meaning this this um, you know in 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 every tashahud at the end of the prayer. So he said, "Istaeedu billahi min arba." Seek refuge in Allah from four. Min adhabi jahannam wa min adhab al qabr wa min fitnat al mahya wa al mamat. Min 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 fitnat al mahya wa al mamat wa min fitnat al masih al tajal. That seek refuge in Allah from four, from the punishment of the hellfire, the punishment of the grave, the, pun- the, the tribulation of life and death, and from the tribulation of the Masih al Tajjal. So these then are two texts which are an indication of the danger of Ar Riya and how Ar Riya nullifies actions and Allah does not accept uh, uh, action which is mixed with Ar Riya. And to finish off, the Shaykh then just summarizes in point by point form some of the lessons. The Shaykh says that these texts. One verse, the verse which is the verse in Surah Al-Kahf, the last verse in Surah Al-Kahf, and these two hadith, these two hadith, they indicate some very great matters. So from them is, first of all, that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a man, is a human. He doesn't have any rububiyya and no uluhiyya in anything. And this contains a refutation of those who exaggerate and who uh, go into extremism regarding the status of the Messenger وسلم, and his right, and who believe, considering the Messenger, that he has some attributes of a rububiya. And they have this attachment to the Messenger, والسلام, an attachment which is prohibited in terms of making dua to him and seeking ref- rescue by way of dua to him and seeking needs by way of him. And asking for their hardships to be removed by way of you know by way of supplication to him, and all of this is the major shirk. The second issue is that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent with the da'wah to tawheed and the prohibition of shirk, and uh, the. Uh, Yeah, that the messenger was sent with the da'wah to tawheed and the prohibition of shirk in general. And this was the same as what all of the prophets and messengers uh, uh, were sent with. And in this is a refutation, as occurs earlier in the, in the Shaykh's point, in the Shaykh's explanation, of those people who claimed that the messenger came to establish hakimiya. Right? Those people who came, those people who claimed that the messenger came to establish hakimiya and to take the rule and so on and so forth. And this is a refutation of, the, of, the, of those people. Thirdly, the verse indicates the obligation to make ikhlas in one's actions for Allah. Fourthly, that in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that Allah is free of need, isn't in a, is free of any need from his servants that they worship him. And is, you know, even if the people uh, were to commit shirk with Allah, or they were to uh, disbelieve in him, or they were all to worship him alone, that would not benefit his dominion in any way, nor would it decrease his dominion in any way if they didn't worship him. The fifth, that in the hadith of Abu Huraira, which contains a warning from shirk in a person's actions, because this is the reason for the rejection of a person's actions, and this is irrespective of whether the action is shirk, major shirk, or minor shirk, or whether it was real, it makes no difference. The sixth point is that the hadith establishes, the hadith of Abu Huraira, that Allah speaks, Allah speaks however, however he wills, and that the attribute of speech is established for Allah, and that it is a sifatun fi'aliyya. It is an action that it, it is an attribute that relates to his actions, and uh, that Allah's speech isn't like the speech of the creation, but it is speech which befits Allah's majesty. The seventh matter is the hadith of Abu Sa'id in Al Khudri is a warning from Al Riya, and the Messenger Ali Sallam he explained what was Al Riya in the hadith itself. That when a man stands, he gave an example. When a man stands. To pray and then he begins to beautify his prayer so that the people around him may look at him, look towards him. And eight in the hadith, in the hadith of Abu Sa'id again that shirk is shirk which uh, is divided into two types: the shirk which is zahir and the shirk which is khafi. Because in this hadith, the, the messenger Ali Sallam clearly mentioned a shirk al khafi, and so this shows that if there is shirk which is khafi and hidden, that therefore there must be shirk which is zahir. And that is the shirk which is outward in one's actions, like in ar-ruku and sujood and du'a and in slaughtering 
and in making oath for other than Allah, and so on and so forth. And finally, as for riyah, then a riyah, then it is the, the, the riyah, the, a riyah is the hidden shirk, and this is the shirk which is in a person's uh, heart and a person's intentions. So the Shaykh continued and said, as for Ar-Riyah, then it is shirk, which is hidden and which is in the people's heart and intentions. And this is why in another hadith, there occurs that shirk in this ummah is more hidden than a black ant on a black like stone in a dark night. This is how the Messenger has likened uh, Ar-Riyah. And as for the expiation of Ar-Riyah, then it is that a person should make the supplication Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika shay'a wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka min al-dhanbi alladhi la a'lam or in another wording wa astaghfiruka li ma la a'lam the meaning which is that a person makes a supplication wallah i seek refuge in you from that i should work, uh, that i should associate partners with you in something that ana uh, in which i know and i'm aware and i seek forgiveness from you in that which i am not aware and the sahaba the shaykh finishes by saying that the sahaba they used to fear from this arya, and the Sheikh says that likewise, every time the iman of a servant increases, then his fear of arya should likewise increase, and his fear from all of the types of shirk should also increase. And on that note, the Sheikh finishes, and we finish that chapter there. And uh, at the end of the lesson, inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue with the second half of this topic. In the next lesson, which is the subject of when a person, he intends by way of his actions, which are actions of ibadah, but he intends by them, actions, he intends by them to seek something from the dunya. And how this also is from shirk. And the shaykh will clarify the difference between this here and between arriya, between the difference between the two, because there is a slight difference between the two. So inshallah, we'll leave that till the next time that we meet, inshallah ta'ala.